Okay, hello. Uh, my name is Igor Rudan. I'm a professor at the University of Edinburgh. And I'll tell you uh, about the Chunri method, which is a method that really became popular in setting research priorities uh, all over the world in all kinds of sciences. So uh, this is really uh, a method that is trying to, in a sense, measure uh, the ideas. Uh, and uh, we will see how we do that, because you need to try to compare ideas uh, one to another, and then this is not an easy uh, thing to do, is it? You know, it's a very subjective thing. So how in the world did we manage to put together a method which is allowing you to uh, compare different ideas and tell you which one is a better idea and which one is worse? I'll try to show you in this presentation. So when did it all start? I think it all started in 2005 <coughs> when the World Bank uh, realized that they weren't terribly happy with how um, uh, research prioritization was done in uh, health sciences. And uh, they were working with, with Global Forum for Health Research. This was uh, based uh, in Geneva, organization based in Geneva, which was trying to monitor uh, global uh, funding for health research and trends in global health research. But typically, what would happen when anyone tried to set research priorities is they would put uh, people in a room, some experts uh, together like you here, and then they would deliberate for two days and they would come up with some priorities. But nobody knew what was really going on in that room and nobody could replicate. So those were their priorities which then would be accepted by some other people and then other people and nobody then could really trace whether these were the right priorities or not. So there was a need for a transparent, uh, more replicable democratic uh, process to set research priorities that people could understand after the process has been completed. And um, uh, in the year 2005, the World Bank and the Global Forum for Health Research were, were looking uh, for a consultant uh, to develop a method that could help them uh, develop some sort of a process uh, which would be accepted widely as a good approach to setting research priorities. And uh, I applied and uh, I was given uh, this uh, task. So I was given a budget of about I think half a million dollars to put together a group of anyone in the world I wanted so that we tried to uh, develop a method that could set research priorities. So we started, I think, in 2005, and I really invited people that I didn't know uh, by that time. I wanted to have the most uh, multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary group that uh, you can imagine. I wanted to have people uh, who were economists, who were ethicists, uh, uh, molecular uh, people, you know, public health people, uh, people from all uh, sorts of uh, backgrounds, uh, managerial experts, to help me think through how a process should look which could um, be up to this task. So we started in 2005. I invited those people firstly to Geneva and then we kept meeting about four times a year in all these lovely places and then we really kind of got together as a group really well and uh, you know we were getting along really well and thinking things through. So we kept meeting in all these lovely places in 2006 and then we really you know started enjoying our work and kept meeting in 2007 in further lovely places and unfortunately in 2007 in Beijing we ran out of money as you may imagine. So at that point it, we realized we needed to come uh, up uh, and publish what we have done and uh, present to the world what is now known as <coughs> the Chinry method for setting uh, research priorities. Recently in 2016 uh, Sachio Yoshida from World Health Organization has analyzed approaches, tools and methods that are used for setting priorities in health research in the 21st century. And I'm very happy to say that although we only revealed our method to the world in 2007, uh, by 2016 it was already the most used uh, method and I think this a uh, piece of a, a pie chart will continue to expand. The Del Delphi method that was a dominant approach before that is now squeezed to only a quarter. Consultation, a another uh, approach that is not really replicable, 
uh, has also been used less. There is a James Lind alliance method that's been used also. Uh, just um, there's combined approach matrix, uh, a literature review with the questionnaire, uh, online surveys, or even no description of approach. So this is just showing you how few <coughs> uh, replicable approaches are there, but the dictionary method is slowly but surely taking more and more uh, space of all the publications that are trying to set research priorities as a method of choice. So what is this method? And what were we discussing during those meetings, uh, uh, those 12 meetings that we held um, in this transdisciplinary uh, group? Well, we realized that uh, through a lot of talk that there are some really core fundamental challenges if you want to compare different research ideas to each other and say which one is a priority over the other. The first major challenge is that the number of potential research ideas is infinite. So how are you going to manage infinity? It is only limited by imagination of all the living scientists today. And uh, you know, there is no limit to the number of uh, research ideas that you could potentially uh, generate or pose. So how are you going to manage this uh, uh, infinity? How are you going to be fair to every possible imaginable idea and know that you did not skip it or uh, do something? So that, that, that is already you know, such a difficult problem that we had no idea uh, at the first uh, what to do about it. But then we started working and the first breakthrough was when we realized that we can split this infinite universe of ideas to four uh, smaller <laughs> universes, they are still infinite, but uh, at least they are clearly separated from one another. Firstly, there are descriptive research ideas. And let me uh, show you what that means. So let's say that you come to a population and all these people have certain health problems and now you would like to conduct some health research. Clearly, uh, these people, if they all put all of their health problems on a piece of paper and each person puts a piece of paper in a barrel, that barrel would be their burden of disease. And then if um, some of them are exposed to some further risk factors, such as, I don't know, this could be smoking, this could be drinking, this could be uh, exposure to indoor uh, air pollution, for example, and you can see that some are exposed to even uh, more than one of those risk factors at the same time, while others are not exposed at all. Then, because of this risk exposure, uh, there is a bigger uh, burden of disease than it should be, right? But at the same time, uh, the government or people themselves are also placing some interventions which are effective to a degree, so this could be the vaccination, this could be support group against uh, smoking or drinking, and because of that the burden is actually smaller than it could be. So what is the first universe of these research questions in health research? Well, the first universe is any research questions that are going to try to describe the health situation, okay? So describing the health situation, any research that it needs to be conducted to describe the health situation should be uh, considered the first universe of ideas. You know, just trying to understand the problem and the determinants of the problem and what can be done about the problem, those are uh, the descriptive research ideas. Okay? Then, when you think about this situation, what else could you do to improve the state of these people by research? Well, you can start doing research to see and explore how within the same amount of money that is being invested here you could reduce the burden of disease even further. For example, you could realize that you can make this intervention one somehow more accessible uh, to people or that this group of um, uh, people here um, are not the right group of people to target with anti-alcoholic interventions that in fact you should target these people who are uh, really uh, at the moment drinking or smoking, okay? So basically, just understanding that what you're doing is not targeted at the right people or could be done even uh, better, uh, that is your health policy and systems research, that is your delivery uh, research, that is your implementation research. That research could uh, allow you to, within the same 
context and with the same amount of funding to achieve more. Okay? So thanks to that, you could reduce the burden of disease all right? uh, through that research. And then once you've done that, what else can you do? You could then improve these interventions that you have. For example, if this is a vaccine and it has seven serotypes, you could add more serotypes and have 13 serotypes. So that would be an enhanced vaccine which would not be maybe 70% effective against all pneumonia or a diarrhea, but maybe 90% effective. Okay, I'm not being realistic here, maybe it's like from 30 to 50 or something like that. But <coughs> what I'm saying is basically you could enhance the interventions that already exist so that you make them better somehow through health research and then they become more effective. Or you can again through health research uh, make uh, some intervention uh, m cheaper or more deliverable or more affordable or more sustainable even, right? And then uh, thanks to improving that intervention and making it m more accessible, sustainable, whatever, uh, you have reached more people with that intervention. So either the intervention becomes better, more effective on its own, or it becomes more applicable. All right? uh, and uh, if you can improve your interventions, that's the third universe of research ideas in health research, which are development research ideas, you know, development of in interventions, further development. Right? And then, thanks to that, you reduce the burden of disease. So now that you exhausted those possibilities, what else could you do through research to improve health of this population? Well, you can think of completely new interventions, all right? You can add, you can do fundamental basic research that shows something that nobody knew, and then you can think uh, of completely new interventions based on that progress in fundamental basic research, right? So, this is stemming from basic research, and that is discovery research ideas, which are supposed to lead to new interventions. But those new interventions, as you can see, when they are introduced first, they are usually going to be expensive, they're going to be only available to a few people in the population, and then little by little they become cheaper, more accessible, and so on. So uh, you can see that's the fourth uh, possible universe, sub-universe, sub these are sub-universes, sub-universe of research ideas, they are about discovery and then from the fundamental research uh, it goes downstream to uh, their translation and development of completely new interventions which we do not have today. Okay? Thanks to them we could further reduce the burden of disease and maybe over time by many of those new interventions applied to absolutely everyone we can completely remove the burden of some diseases, such as which we do with good vaccines against the diseases which are only limited to uh, humans, and uh, then we can wipe them out of the face of the planet. All right, so uh, it, we could remove completely some uh, burden of some diseases if we continue down this path. So we realized that okay, you know, it, there is an infinite universe of ideas, but in fact, we can subdivide it into four uh, universes, which kind of are uh, logically um, separated. And how did we call them? We call them the four Ds, description, <coughs> delivery, development, and discovery. And this is really epidemiological research, health systems and policy research, research to improve the existing interventions, and research to develop new interventions. So we called those types, either research type or domain or instrument of health research. And their generalized version is how to describe the problem, how to increase efficiency using the existing means, how to improve the existing means themselves, and how to develop new and better means to remove the burden of disease. Okay? So that is your sub-universes of health research ideas. So now that we got here, we started thinking, okay, now let us, let us sub-branch those universes further. And then at least we will know that we are being kind of comprehensive and systematic across the spectrum and that we're not missing uh, anything important. So from research instruments, we then started thinking what would be the research avenues 
uh, within that instrument. So for example, for description, that would be measuring the burden, understanding risk factors, evaluating the existing interventions. For the delivery, it would be studying capacity to reduce exposure to proven health risks and studying capacity to deliver efficacious interventions. For the development, it would be research to improve deliverability, affordability, sustainability of the interventions. And in the discovery, you could do discovery to introduce new interventions through basic research, clinical research, public health uh, research. Suddenly we had three, five, um, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Suddenly we had eleven sub-universities and probably there are some more avenues here, uh, but eventually when you then present it like this, then you can start filling these with research options. So this is now from instrument to avenue to option. We're getting more and more specific. And then we realized there is a depth of, a depth of uh, a research idea. You know, it can be very general, but it can be very specific. So ideally, if you want to compare them, you want to compare them at the same level of uh, width or depth or whatever you want to call it. So we realized that one thing that's going to be intuitive to all scientists all over the world would be the level of like five-year research projects or four, three-year research projects because this is where in fact the decisions of prioritization of research ideas takes place. You apply for grants anyway. So someone somewhere um, uh, has to compare the ideas proposed in the grants anyway and this is where the prioritization uh, takes place anyway at the moment. Okay, And this is what we want to improve. So we said to people when you are proposing your research ideas think in terms of a five-year research project. Don't make it too specific because you can go even more specific. You can call it a specific research question. And what is the question? The question is something that would correspond to a title of a research paper. Okay, But from a grant you would typically have 10, 20 uh, research papers. Okay, So basically these are very specific ideas and we don't really want them because then there would be too many. What we want is really a level of research uh, uh, project. So we, real, uh, we, we agreed that as long as we are aware of this kind of branching and then we can align all the research uh, ideas at the level of research projects against those avenues, we can at least be certain that we're not missing a complete research avenue, you know, that we're, we, we are having every single research avenue represented by at least a set of a good research options. And then of course, yes, maybe we are missing an option here and an option uh, there, but at least for the vast majority of ideas we will know that uh, if they are feasible they would be uh, included here. And then um, we realized that okay, the number of research options will still be very large, but at least this approach is inclusive, representative and still manageable. And if we can uh, you know, get to several hundreds of these ideas, then we would probably be uh, fine and it would be difficult for anyone to say that they can come up with something uh, better to ensure that the whole process has been comprehensive in terms of ideas. Okay? <clears throat> now, that was the first major challenge. You can see how major and problematic it was, but there were two other. The second one is Outcomes of research ideas are unpredictable. You, you can't know when you start doing some research whether you're going to be successful or not, or are you going to find something or not. Then if we knew, then everyone would be a super successful researcher and get many prizes if they always knew what they'll find from their research. So how can we say that something is not a priority or a priority if we can't say where the research leads to and what is going to be achieved through uh, research? And many of the best uh, uh, research ideas which led to the biggest progress in science came from a completely, you know, some, some completely outside ideas which nobody thought at the time were important but they proved to be very important much later, okay? So how do we manage this uncertainty of the outcome? How can we say something is not a priority if it may lead to a Nobel Prize 20, 30 years later because uh, it really showed to be very important? Whew. So, we started thinking about the context of prioritization. Uh, we started thinking maybe if we understand the context of priority setting for health research really, really well, then maybe we can say what 
makes more sense and what makes less sense. So let's start with understanding the context of prioritization because it's very tricky this context. Firstly, somebody is going to invest in this health research. So they need to be transparent about what is their motivation, why are they investing in health research? Is it to reduce the burden of disease, like get rid of part of it? Is it to develop intellectual property and patents and then make profit from it? Is it <clears throat> to find something spectacularly novel and important and win a Nobel Prize? So what is it? You know, because motivations for people who are in health research can be vastly different. Is it, what is their investment style? Uh, do they want to be a very rational investors with a balanced portfolio? Do they want to be risk averse? Do they want to be risk seeking? And I think you can already now recognize who are the main players in health research. If the governments you are, are using taxpayers' money to fund health research for all of us, right? then they probably want to remove the burden of disease as much as possible and they want to be reasonably balanced and responsible investors. If pharmaceutical industry are the ones behind health research, they're probably their industry. Never forget that they are industry. They're responsible to their shareholders and they are there to make profit, create jobs. You know, they're not necessarily primarily um, interested in how much burden of disease they reduce, they are a business, okay? So they need to generate intellectual property, they uh, are probably going to be very risk averse in their investments because it's going to eat into their profits, right? And then you have uh, <coughs> clearly uh, someone like Bill Gates who is, or Warren Buffett who are philanthropists or Carlos Slim who can just give billions to uh, health research of their own money, but since um, they are still all uh, mortal people just like everyone else and have limited amount of time, still they would maybe like to achieve something within their lifetime and then they can be very risk-seeking. They can say, I'm going to put one billion dollars into a vaccine for malaria because uh, we need a vaccine. I, I want to eradicate malaria as my legacy to the planet. Okay, So you can be even risk-seeking and then based on your investment style, different ideas may be priority. So for pharmaceutical industry, uh, developing a vaccine for malaria is certainly attractive, but because it's so difficult, it may be a risk, um, uh, you know, uh, too, too risky, whereas for Bill Gates it may not. And for the government, so they could just uh, place it, but they're somewhere in between. Now also, you need to know what population are you addressing? Are you addressing global, regional, national, subnational, or specific age group, or gender, or uh, ethnic group, or whatever? Uh, you, you need to be very clear who is your target. And also, what is your target? Um, are you, is it a burden of disease, is it a specific disease, organic system, is it perhaps a product? And finally, maybe even the most importantly, very important for prioritization research ideas in health, is your time frame. Are you expecting to get your results and big breakthroughs very shortly, or over a medium time period, or a long term time in the future? Okay? Because Depending on your time frame, the priorities can completely shift. If you need to have some uh, demonstration of impact of your research within 10 years, then you're going to go for the low-hanging fruit, for the research that's certainly going to help you to become more effective with what you already have. Whereas, if you have 30 uh, years time window, then you can become more ambitious and thinking long term and take more risks and try to get somewhere in 30 years by uh, uh, funding more upstream uh, research, okay? And now, now, once you have been extremely transparent about your context, now is the time to say, okay, but then what criteria can we use to set research uh, priorities, to distinguish the idea from another based on the context within which the prioritization is taking place. Because now the context that we define are helping us to say which idea is making more sense and which idea is making less sense. You remember we're talking here about the unpredictability of 
uh, uh, research outcomes. So we are trying to manage this unpredictability of research outcomes by defining very well the context and the expectations of those who are the investors in order to say which idea makes more sense within this context and which makes less sense. And how are we going to say this? Well, we define, we define the process of health research as a process which starts with a research question and then uh, if we answer the research question, we should generate new knowledge. This generated new knowledge, this is not where the health research stops. Uh, it has to have a vision of translation and implementation and disease burden reduction. Otherwise, it can't really be considered health research. I mean, the reason we do health research is because we want to improve health of the population, not just to answer questions and generate new knowledge, right? I mean, that's, there's a lot of fundamental research in natural sciences that do that, but frankly, if you want to call it health research, you have to have some sort of a vision of burden of disease reduction. So what is happening? All too frequently, unfortunately, the research does stop here, uh, generates you know, a lot of novelty and attraction and gets published in high impact journals, gets a lot of media coverage, a lot of lobbying, and then uh, leads to further questions and you get trapped into this cycle of constantly expanding the frontier through millions and millions of papers on PubMed, you're constantly expanding the frontier between the known and the unknown, but with doing extremely uh, little to eventually translate that knowledge and th from that frontier into the benefits for the population. There is a big disbalance between the papers that are just trying uh, to generate exciting new knowledge and uh, answer exciting novel questions as opposed to actually uh, research which is trying to translate uh, and implement it and generate disease burden reduction. You can compare it to those first mobile phones. So basically that would mean that the uh, first scientists would, as, as soon as they figure out how to make a big ugly mobile phone that actually works, to them the problem is solved. They've generated the solution. But then the industry comes and they uh, need to make those mobile phones far more, uh, far smaller, far uh, more uh, pleasing for, for the consumers to buy them, uh, you know, far cheaper. So this is where, um, where scientists are bored. And not just the scientists, but the panels of um, uh, those who are evaluating research grants, they start thinking of this as boring, you know, because this is exciting, new, 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 new. Uh, whereas um, how to translate it? Well, you know, the research problem has been solved, now translation of it uh, leads to often to a rejection. And, and it's, <laughs> it's particularly uh, confusing that this happens mainly with the public uh, money and at the boards of uh, public uh, investors into health research uh, that uh, they are driven by novelty, uh, whereas the public money should be the money that is mainly uh, you know, invested into translation uh, of um, the research for the benefit of the population. So, once we uh, realize that this is the uh, whole kind of a process of health research and that we do not want to be trapped into this cycle, we want it to always run all the way to the end, we realize that there are some criteria that, that can tell us how likely is it that we get from one step to another. So the Chenry method said, firstly, to get from research question to generating new knowledge, the question needs to be answerable in an ethical way. Then to get from new knowledge to translation, we need to demonstrate that there is some effectiveness of the solution. To get from translation and implementation to disease burden reduction, well, the solution needs to be deliverable, affordable, to the population. And even when we get to the burden of disease reduction, that reduction may be bigger or smaller for some research ideas. And even more so, the reduction can be mainly achieved among the wealthy in the population or among the poor or just uh, be equity neutral. So you see, we, we, we realize that there are at least five criteria that are telling us very well uh, how likely is it that we get from one step of the process to another step. And these criteria now become the Chenry Methods criteria that can distinguish what is a better and what is a worse uh, idea. But 
Then, you know, because we were a big group with multiple backgrounds, we realized that uh, there are many other criteria that we could potentially use, uh, like uh, how attractive is uh, the research, how novel, uh, what is its feasibility, affordability and cost, what about ethical aspects, what about public opinion, community involvement, local research capacity, uh, generating patents, should we think about those as well? Well, and the most importantly, decision on research investment priorities based on different criteria will necessarily conflict each other. So one criterion will be saying this is a better <coughs> idea, but the other criterion may be saying the other one is a better idea. So what happens then? Well, this is now uh, leading us to the third major uh, challenge. How do we now use these conceptual breakthroughs to somehow measure and rank all feasible ideas in some fair, transparent and replicable way. How do we do that? Well, 2007 was the advent of a phenomenon of the 21st century that now became far more prominent over the last 10 years, and that was crowdsourcing. Okay? So the wisdom of crowds, why the many are smarter than the few, and how collective wisdom shapes business, economies, societies and nations, that was a very a popular book that was published in 2007 and um, uh, written by James uh, Sorovetsky and also another one by Jeff Ho about crowdsourcing and why the power of the crowd is driving the future of business. Okay, All of a sudden we realized, wait a minute, there is a new thing which perhaps could be used to achieve this goal of saying which idea is better than the other. So the central idea is that a diverse collection of independently deciding individuals is likely to make certain types of decisions and predictions better than any experts in vast majority of cases. So if you're just asking two or three people and their opinion, and if you're asking thousands or hundreds uh, people of, of their collective opinion, the collective opinion of many will, you know, the biases will kind of cancel each other out and the prediction is going to be better than three people with their own personal biases. So you're minimizing your risk of being wrong if you're leaving it to a more uh, people, but they do need to have some knowledge of the thing. So what are the requirements for those crowds to be wise? Because crowds sometimes can be completely unwise as we know. So firstly, there has to be diversity of opinion in that crowd. Each person should have a completely private information, even if it's just an eccentric interpretation of the known facts. We don't mind because we want to capture that diversity of opinion. Uh, independence. People's opinions aren't determined by the opinions of those around them. This is something that Delphi Method doesn't have because when you get into a room with the two or three biggest experts in the world, they usually drive the discussion and their personal opinion affect opinions of others in the room and then two opinions become 20 opinions, people leave the room, become 100 or 1000 opinions, become million opinions, you know, and all coming from two or three heads. So that is not um, really safe for uh, us when we're setting priorities. The third one is decentralization. People are able to specialize and draw on their local knowledge. We want to know how things work in as many contexts as possible. And aggregation, there has to be some mechanism for turning private judgments of many, many people into a collective decision. And this is what Chenry process really is. So we realized we're going to make Chenry process a mechanism of getting a lot of collective uh, uh, opinions uh, about various ideas into one and see how to present it then. So, your typical consensus development process before Chenry was that there was a background reading, uh, round one of discussion in Delphi, expert interaction, they were deliberating feedback to experts of their process and then second round of discussion and consensus on priorities. So this is a typical Delphi method and it sounds good but the trouble is that it's not replicable, it's entirely subjective based on the people who take part, whereas the Chinry method does not require any background reading, does not require any discussion of people, no interactions of people at all, all you, they do is submit their personal individual opinion and then you give them feedback and you can even do the agreement statistics, you can take their uh, input and even do the statistics of over the questions over which you had the biggest agreement or the biggest disagreement and there is no need for consensus because you simply average their input and see what they're all saying to you. you know? So they don't have to agree among themselves uh, but we still get the collective opinion. Alright, so finally 
once we made those three conceptual breakthroughs over three extremely fundamentally difficult problems with uh, prioritizing health research, we could propose something that we call the Chenry method. So the Chenry method starts with the investors. Um, they can uh, define the context, they have to define the context, define the criteria that they want to use uh, to set ideas apart, and select a management group that will conduct the Chenry exercise. And once they've done that, we ask them to gently you know, remove themselves. We bring in the management committee of the Chenry exercise, and then they have to choose the larger uh, group of technical experts. Why do we want a larger group of technical experts? Because we want to ask the people in the world who are the most likely to have knowledge over those um, uh, areas that we want to t do health research priorities in. So why not choosing those that are going to be going for those grants anyway, and why not build on their opinion? They are going to know more about this than anyone else in the world. So you can select, say, 200 most productive people in that research area in the past five years and get their collective opinion on the state of their, um, their field. Okay? So that's what we're doing here. We really try to get involved the most um, knowledgeable people in some field and get their collective opinion about what uh, is more and what is less likely to work. Then you write to them, you get them involved in the exercise, you ask them to submit uh, many of their ideas for research and then uh, you consolidate this list, management team consolidates lists, removes the duplicate, sends them a scoring sheet and you ask them to score all research ideas against those five or more or less criteria for priority setting. And then finally, you don't want to also leave everyone else behind. You don't want to make this an elitist process where you have some sort of an elite uh, researchers telling the rest of the world what needs to be done. No, you also want to involve the general public somehow, but how? They cannot give you opinion on which research idea is better or worse, because they simply don't have much knowledge about this. But what they can say is which of these criteria that are used are more or less important to them, okay? So you can survey them to give you a threshold or weights, different weights on those criteria that you're using. So to say, if the criterion of equity is not 80% met, then no matter how good everything else is, you should not consider that research idea a priority, okay? Because we are not happy that with, with its equity uh, thing. Or say, uh, well, we want something to work, so give effectiveness more weight than anything else. Or uh, we are sensitive over equity, we want equity to be weighted far more than other uh, research options, all right? Or we don't want our money to be uh, wasted on some uh, research that's not going to work, so we want to know that it's answerable, so give answerability more weight, okay? Or we, want, we don't want to fund research that's not going to have a big impact on our health, so only fund the research that has a big potential to reduce the burden, okay? So don't make anything else a priority. So this is how they get engaged. And then the management team calculates the rankings for each research idea and presents it back to the funders. And what this list looks like, well, it starts like this and then it goes down to 200, 300, 400 research ideas depending on how many of them were scored. You have your research type, whether it's health policy and systems or epidemiological or new or so on. And basically, you can turn all these collective opinions, if you're asking them to score with yes or no, do they believe this is going to be answerable, uh, and um, um, what is the big, big, big potential on the burden of disease reduction. So basically, when you take all their scores into account and average them, you get a number between 0 and 100, and all of a sudden, what did you do here then? You get uh, this for five different uh, criteria, you can then weight these criteria, give them more or less weight, and finally you get your priority score for each of research idea, which, which is a number from 0 to 100. So what did you do here? Basically, out of thin air, you visualized the opinion of 200 most knowledgeable people in the world or on some field on hundreds of their own uh, research ideas and presented those numbers to the funders. So you created a lot of value for the funders from simply nothing, you know, just by asking people to uh, give you their ideas from their heads and then to 
tell them, um, tell you what they think is more or less likely to work. So this is really useful information for the funders because it shows you what is the strength and what is the weakness of each research idea in the opinion, collective opinion of 200 most knowledgeable persons, okay, or even more, right? So you created some value for uh, the funders without actually spending a lot of time or money. So what does the dictionary uh, do? It measures, really measures the collective optimism of many researchers towards each proposed idea within an agreed context and using the agreed criteria. The large number of health research options receive their intermediate and overall priority scores, which are all quantitative and just range from 0 to 100. Uh, advantages or, or, and disadvantages of each research idea become transparent, scores are intuitive, and the result is actually democratic and replicable and easy to understand. Now, when we proposed this, there was a big misconception. People started being worried about this because they thought, well, all of a sudden you get these numbers and ranks and this is basically telling uh, the donors what to do and, uh, you know, other opinions are no longer relevant or necessary. What about uh, the complexity of everything, blah, blah. But uh, this is a complete misconception. So, so they, those people were completely uh, missing the point of, of this whole thing. So the Chunri is not telling anyone what to do. Basically, it only offers you useful, valuable information which can protect you from some risky or, uh, or, or poor uh, choice investments. Uh, because if you know that there is, for example, 20 here uh, burden reduction uh, in developing interventions to promote safe food handling, clearly you have a problem with this uh, idea which the experts identified. It's answerable, yes, effective would be, yes, deliverable, yes, it's equitable, absolutely, but you see there seems to be a problem which may not be uh, realized. And now compare this to the Delphi exercise. In the Delphi exercise you can have maybe 20 people in a room, only five of them get to speak, and uh, two, three hours of deliberations, and how many of ideas can you really discuss in that time and how, for how many of them can you really go in great depth thinking through all those things. Whereas here, you know, you just leave everyone to put their input and suddenly you have all the wealth of information on hundreds of ideas based on uh, five or more uh, criteria, okay? So uh, it's easy to conduct this exercise because it doesn't cost much at all. I mean, you just email people and get their input and ask them to score. And if they're willing to participate, this is um, what you get. Um, so uh, it's easy to score this. You know, many thousands participated already in more than 100 Chenry exercises. It's easy to publish this later because we had, um, at this point of this presentation, more than 70 papers since 2007, many in leading world health journals. Uh, now it's probably more than 100. And it's easy to interpret them because you get a list of ranked questions with their scores. And does this remind you of anything? Well, of course. I mean, the sim same thing is when you want to send your child to uh, a university, look, this is exactly the same uh, thing. You get the list of universities based on a peer review score, employer review score, so there's like some six clear transparent criteria and an overall score which goes from 0 to 100. And this is not telling you to which university you should send your child, it's just allowing you to see for many options what are their strengths and weaknesses and then you decide based on taking into account the cost of this what you want to do and how do you want to balance your portfolio of your children. If you have five children you can then decide where which child goes and you know your budget and uh, uh, it's the same with this health research you have a budget and you have to then choose and pick how you combine your investments okay uh, similarly the stock market i mean uh, when you get to the stock market you have the listing of thousands of companies and you have their uh, p over e ratio their p over s ratio um, and uh, also you know, price uh, over earnings price over sales or whatever and you do not 
actually, uh, you know, this listing of these companies, you absolutely want to know the parameters for each company. That doesn't tell you which companies you should invest in and buy stock of. It's just informing you what is the current situation. And then you decide how to balance your portfolio. So that's what Trinary does. It doesn't tell you what to do. It just allows you um, tons of information so that you can choose how to balance your portfolio. All right? So what is then the Chenry method for prioritizing ideas? It's a process that prioritizes a large number of competing ideas using a defined context, transparent criteria and collective wisdom. So it starts with investors who define context, criteria and expectations. Then it goes to technical experts who list research options, apply criteria and score research options. And then to other stakeholders who weight uh, the criteria, they can weight the criteria differently or place some thresholds and adjust the final scores and then back to investors who can then decide what they want to do. And this is what it looks like, your research priority score for each research idea is going to be somewhere between 0 and 100 for each one of them, okay, and then you take the average, but then you can have your um, uh, stakeholders input which can place uh, uh, thresholds so you have to be above certain uh, threshold or even weights you can multiply each of the score by certain factor to give it more or less weight so this is how we calculate the scores and as I said in 2007 we ran out of money and eventually we had to publish this process so we published it as a series of four papers the first one was assessment of principles and practice of health research. Uh, secondly was the universal challenges and conceptual framework for Chenry, which I here explain. The third one was how do you address the values of stakeholders. And then finally we presented this team of lovely people, presented the guidelines of implementation of the Chenry uh, method uh, uh, eventually, right? So this was the group of people that put the whole a thing together over a period of um, three years. Okay, so implementation of the Turner method. After this, there's been tons of uptakes. People realized its potential value. You can see the Lancet's Plus Medicine and Bulletin WHO Journal of Global Health. So uh, this is now the first 43 papers because I could not squeeze in more into this frame, but now we're close to 100 or just about over 100 already uh, since 2007. You can see how uh, the publication number uh, grew. This is now something that we, we would like to also achieve with other tools such as Equist and uh, Paths, a uh, similar trajectory, okay? Um, right, so review of the context in the first publications. Let us see then in these first publications, how many of those who implemented Chenry have stuck with our original guidelines published in those four papers uh, in 2007 and 2008, uh, and how many of them actually decided to change something? So the context was global. Uh, when you, now we are analyzing only those first 43 papers. Uh, there is going to be an updated analysis of 50 was actually published and there's going to be an updated on 100. But this was based on 43 <coughs> first, first 43 publications. So the context was global for setting research priorities in 13 papers. Low and middle income country focused in 24 papers or 55%. And then some national level exercises in South Africa, India, Brazil, Chile and Nepal. And there was one in the crisis setting as a context, okay? Uh, time frame, uh, well, uh, it was less than five years, so very short time frame where some change was expected in 7% of the exercises. Five to 10 years in 11%, the majority in 10, uh, 10 years, but some even longer, some even much longer. So you can see already that Chinnery method seems to be very flexible because you can use it in national level context, in some specific context, in low and middle income country, regional context, in global context. You can actually vary your time frame depending on your needs. What else? What population has been studied? Well, uh, neonates or stillbirths, that doesn't really surprise because the Chinnery really uh, uh, means child health and nutrition research initiative uh, because they were the ones supporting my application 
for the consultant for developing of the Chinner method. You had to have someone uh, proposing and supporting your application and I was the candidate of the Child Health and Nutrition Research Initiative and this is why we decided to call this method uh, Chinnery. So uh, it was easiest for us to firstly uh, expand its use in the global child uh, health and nutrition context. So it doesn't surprise that it is uh, neonates 16%, the uses of children up to five years 40%, up to 10 years then 7%, but then adolescents and young adults as well. But then uh, there were people suddenly starting picking it up outside of a child health uh, field and you have all age groups and even some special population groups such as mental health issues and disabilities. Uh, now, uh, one thing that is maybe slightly disappointing is that for many of those people who are using the Chinner method, it was quite difficult to really get a good group of stakeholders to place, uh, to put their input on the weights and place thresholds. So in, in the majority of exercises that were published eventually, they just, they just said, well, this is the input from the researchers, this is the completing part of the Chinner. Now, if you think you want to vary your weights and thresholds, you can do that and then rejuggle these, but this is what your uh, template is and now you can change it based your, on your own stakeholders, input in your own country or whatever. Okay, what else? We, as you remember, proposed five original Chunri uh, criteria. One thing that really surprised us when we were looking at the publications was just how many people actually changed those criteria and use some modified set of criteria. So in the majority, in two-thirds of papers that we were looked at, even the first papers, although we were very prescriptive and clear about our five criteria, we realized that 70% almost uh, of the exercises used completely modified criteria. And not just that they've changed the criteria they used, they changed even the number of criteria that they used from uh, three, four, six, nine, even 13 different criteria. So the standard criteria, uh, we looked how many uh, of the, how frequently each one of them was actually retained. Answerability was retained uh, in 81% of cases and equity too. So those seem to be the two criteria that were the most frequently retained ones. Impact on burden less and deliverability and effectiveness even still less. So what were done then those additional criteria that people uh, started to use? This was so exciting for me to look at because it was the community using the Chinry method and modifying it and making it more uh, flexible. And I was wondering what are those other criteria that they were using. So feasibility and acceptability were important to many. Also low cost, uh, sustainability, and then relevance, field ski gap, applicability, fundability, usefulness, ethical, local ownership, added value, attractiveness, immediacy, long-term impact, clarity, needs, sensitive. So you see there's quite a few of others that uh, people actually uh, thought of and found useful in their own exercises, which is great because, you know, this shows you just how uh, flexible this process is and how widely applicable. After the first 43 papers, uh, more than 5,000 experts have been approached to, to take part in Chinri. More than 3,000 have actually submitted their uh, research ideas. Initial response rate is obviously about 60% when you invite people to join your Chinri exercise. Submitted research ideas eventually uh, 8.5 thousand. That ma makes it uh, almost three ideas per expert on average. Consolidated ideas for scoring, so there were many duplicates you can see. So redundancy rate is about 54 percent. Number of experts eventually scoring ideas is much less of those that just submitted ideas, so about 54 percent. <coughs> Number of papers 43, number of citations to date, but this date was I think in 2016, about 1,400 and citations uh, per paper. It seems that every paper gets cited quite a lot even in these first years after publication. So that means that this has really taken uh, a life of its own and now Chinri is a well recognized uh, method. Now, people often ask me, okay, but how do we know that it does a good job? How do we know that Chunri method really is uh, valid, that it really is replicable, that it really uh, is, you know, how do we know that if you don't just take another 200 experts, that you would not get a completely different uh, score? So I had to think of a number of ways in which I would 
uh, showed the robustness of the Chinry uh, uh, method and its uh, validity. Uh, so one of the ways was to show that within the group of scorers, if you give them on the very long list the same question three times, uh, that that question would actually get the same score uh, each time from that group of experts. So that was like internal consistency of scores, that the, the opinions do not vary that much. So what we did in the diarrhea exercise here is that the questions 6, 7 and 15, uh, I mean, no, this is the rank 6, 7 and 15, the questions number 45, 40 and 88 were put within more than 200 or so uh, questions and they were essentially the same question, just reworded in slightly in three different ways. And we were interested, are those three going to be all over the list or are they going to come close together? So out of around 200 questions, they came to number 6, 7 and 15 with the scores of 85.8, 86.8 .8, 81.8. And but we did expect some difference because it's not exactly the same question, but this has just shown us how, and we've done quite a few experiments like this, how uh, internally the method is consistent. The experts always give the same uh, responses and we get the same score, or very similar. But this was then even more important. Uh, the question was, how many people do you need to score this generic exercises? Do you need 20 people, 30, 100, 200? Do you get better with more uh, people engaged? So we uh, conducted experiments on several conducted chinery exercises where we had many, many people scoring. And we were taking a subsamples randomly. We were taking 10,000 subsamples of the much bigger sample just to see whether the subsamples of people of the size of 15 people, 20 people, 25, 30, 35, when you look at the ranks produced by those smaller subsamples on the average, how do, do they, that rank compare with the rank of the whole group? And we found out something very surprising, that the saturation of human collective opinion um, comes about very quickly, actually. You do not need thousands of people. Look what happens. Uh, the Spearman's rank correlation between the ranks of the whole group of, say, 200 experts versus uh, of the subsample of 15 people from them, uh, uh, this is the, the range of the uh, correlations that you could get from many, many different uh, randomly generated uh, subsamples of 15 people. So there is quite a lot of range, but in fact it was around 87%. But look what happens as you move along. As you move along, you realize that when you get to about 45 or 50 uh, people, your uh, rank correlation between the ranks that those smaller subsamples are going to give you versus the bigger group is almost uh, 95%. So that means that you're not going to have a big difference between uh, the ranks of the research ideas, whether you use 50 people or 1,000 people, you know? So this is really exciting for us. This was a way to quantitatively show that the human collective opinion, after you have really asked about 45 to 50 knowledgeable people, you can keep asking 1,000 more and you're not going to change the, the ranking list. That was very, very useful for us because it proved that the, the, the method is valid. You know, you would not change the method if you add 1,000 more people, all right? Uh, so now, I can, uh, after this validation, I can summarize a few thoughts on why do I think the Chenry method is working and why is it expanding, it's, why is its use expanding. Firstly, I think people recognize that it's really trying hard to be systematic because we found an acceptable way of handling an endless spectrum of research ideas through this framework of uh, instruments, avenues, options, questions. The second reason I think uh, well, still one thing to say about this systematic nature. What we have looked into, and this is extremely interesting again, so we're tapping into some phenomenon that were more, maybe more general. This is your number of experts that you invite to submit ideas, and we said that they submit three on average, so, you know, 100 people should submit 300 ideas, 200 people should uh, submit 600 ideas, okay? But what we realized over time is that, in fact, you can uh, invite more and more experts, but the number of really original ideas which are not replicating other people's ideas do not um, grow linearly, but uh, little by little this plateaus and after 
after a while, you just start getting the same ideas that you've already seen from someone else. Which means that although ideas theoretically are endless, in practice there is a saturation. So there is a saturation at some point of how many truly different ideas you can get, no matter how many people you ask. And, and the from input from each further expert is going to be less and less useful because you already uh, had those ideas from previous experts. So it's showing that perhaps in the reality of context, the list is not endless. I mean, it, it is eventually, of course, theoretically, but pr practically the list of ideas is exhaustible uh, to a degree, which is a very good thing for us to know uh, because it overcomes the terrible problem of infinity that we encountered as the first big problem. So this is uh, why, uh, one reason why I think it's popular. The second reason is it's a transparent method, okay? So uncertainty inherent to research is handled by defining context and criteria, capturing the main, the main determinants of uncertainty. So thanks to transparency, you know exactly what the context is. You publish your context clearly at the beginning of each exercise. And also, you know exactly what criteria were used to set the ideas apart. The third reason is it's democratic method, pr truly properly democratic method where you don't have people influencing each other, you have crowdsourcing approach to ideas and scoring and you truly ask the people what they think. The fourth reason is it's inclusive. So there is a role given to donors, to researchers, to other stakeholders, all of whom have a say in the priorities that is tailored to their knowledge and their needs. So this inclusivity makes it uh, um, you know, not something that someone is imposing on others. It is actually trying to get everyone to participate and develop the priorities. Everyone is involved in some degree. The fifth reason, I think, is its flexibility. It's just so flexible. You, you can so easily modify it. You can add criteria, replace criteria, uh, shrink the number of criteria. You can uh, change the time frame, the population. You can uh, apply it to anything in a way that you find it more useful. Like you can get rid of effective and um, change it with focus, uh, uh, gaps for scale up, uh, change deliverability into national policy attention, change the equitability into ownership by local actors. So whatever serves your, uh, um, your uh, exercise, and this was a implementation research prioritization for, I think, newborns uh, in the world. And uh, the sixth reason is so simple. Because although it's quantitative in its outcomes, it's based on a simple qualitative yes, no input, avoiding any complicated mathematical or statistical model. So everyone everywhere feels like they can run a Chenry exercise. You don't need any fancy statistics to have your results. Scores are intuitive, understandable to users, they're replicable, amenable to agreement statistics, post-exercise validation and evaluation. It's cheap uh, to conduct and easy to publish and this is what you get as your output, a simple table with intuitive outcomes from 0 to 100. So now that we have this method and it's working and these are the reasons why I think it's working, um, the further applications are to prioritize ideas in any area actually, why limit ourselves to Health research. In global health, we can modify it to prioritize investments in health care, health technologies, development assistance for health, global health governance. Beyond global health, it's a simple and cheap tool that allows assembling and analyzing collective knowledge and opinion of many people. It is of possible use to other donor agencies, international organizations, for-profit companies even, in setting their own strategic priorities among many different ideas based on collective knowledge of their most qualified employees. So, you know, this method could help you if you're in a government organization and people are paralyzed by fear of proposing some new ideas to move forward and nobody does anything, you can just run the chuntry and ask your employees to submit ideas and to rank them and then you basically have your list of priorities and you can actually move forward without anyone having to take any personal risk uh, or responsibility for um, the outcomes because you can say well we follow the the ideas of a majority of people or within the company when if you're worried about your strategic direction and that the board is not listening enough to the wide opinions within the company you can ask your top managers to you know 100 200 to give all ideas they have and then you can run the chinry and decide your strategic priorities 
Now, guidelines for implementation. Well, uh, we work quite hard to now revise the Chunri uh, method and to, to, to make a Chunri 2.0 uh, um, after having all these experiences. So we published a series of seven articles in Journal of Global Health in 2016 and 2017. You can look at them. Uh, it's setting health research priorities using the Chunri method 1 to 7. Uh, and uh, that gives you the most up-to-date uh, instructions on how to think about uh, doing a Chunri exercise and conducting it. Uh, examples of implementation, the best ones you will find in this review, uh, setting health research priorities using the Chunri method, a review of the first 50 applications of the Chunri method. You have to look for supplementary online information in this paper, which is giving you uh, the, the uh, presentation of uh, the characteristics of those first uh, 50 publications. Um, uh, national level exercise, a very impressive one, Narendra Arora and his colleagues, research priorities in maternal newborn child health and nutrition for the whole of India, an Indian Council of Medical Research Initiative. This was a really impressive study in 2017, which involved 893 experts from all over India, 256 of their institutions, and they ranked more than 4,000 research ideas for to set uh, Indian priorities, research priorities in maternal child, newborn health and nutrition. Really good example of what can be achieved with the Chinri. Um, more than 10 exercises were published in the Lancet and PLOS Medicine in those 10 years, so clearly they are reaching the best uh, journals. And now, you know, having completed this whole exercise, we came to realize that there is something that we may even start thinking about global health research system, where it starts with uh, public sector donors and private sector donors uh, and there is a need here to coordinate funding among the donors. So we were thinking, is Chunri the only method that is needed uh, and where does it sit in the just global health research system which produces knowledge? Well, then you have recipients, uh, research teams generating new knowledge and there is a need to prioritize among many research ideas. I think this is where Chunri sits. It helps recipients of the funding to uh, generate new knowledge, but it should also help private sector donors to coordinate funding among donors. Stakeholders governing dissemination of the new knowledge need to somehow recognize successful research. So how is that done? How is it recognizing the successful research done? Well, obviously by tracing their citations and metrics and various things. Dissemination of new knowledge is there is a need at this stage to ensure broad and rapid accessibility. This is now achieved through open access uh, publications and so on. And then we should, um, this, should be, this could be freely available to your, all users if it's open access, but also there is some re with restricted access to charge. Here uh, at this stage we should really, there is a need to evaluate returns on investments in health research. That is something that no one's really uh, doing much and or knows how to do. So there's still still clearly some needs in this global health research system to, to help it achieve more efficiency um, as a whole. Also one thing that we still need to do is uh, uh, develop a software to conduct Chenry online and make it easily uh, done. We have conducted the software uh, for laptops, but actually we should, we should create a data science platform on the internet that allows everyone to just log in and set up their own exercise and run it online. And um, this has been useful for the people who were doing it in various places, but we should really open it up to the whole uh, world. Now is a good time. So thank you very, very much for your attention. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thanks very much.